There's something spooky about the remote upper peninsula of Michigan. Eerie lights, haunted woods, and children left to their own devices with sinister spells populate the snow-driven wilderness. Would you dare to visit? Our guest today grew up amongst these ghosts and has his own memorable stories to share, along with some folklore from the area. Settle in for a cold night, today on Homespun Hates. Hello, Hainted Loves. Welcome to Homespun Hates. I'm Becky. And I'm Diana. And we are coming at you live in the same room for the first time in three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> We're live with each other. We're not live with you, Hainted Loves, but we are live with one another. We are here in Atlanta. So if we sound a little different, that's because we are recording from a haunted house. Yes, a carriage house here in Roswell. Yes, Roswell, Georgia. <laughs> it's a little cold, so if you hear us sipping on our tea... We're just trying to stay warm. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) We're going to be joined by Ron Rickey. He is an author. He's from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Another Michigander. Yes, as we know. It seems to be very haunted. It's given Florida a run for its money. (laughs) Sorry, Florida. A bunch of haunted skeptics, really. Yeah, Michiganders. Yep, Florida, you're losing the race here. We need more Florida storytellers. If you live in Florida, <clears throat> Florida man, Florida woman, get back on this show. We love you. But we also love people from Michigan. 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 So we're excited to hear from Ron here in a minute. Well, Diana, I'm glad that we are hanging out in your Airbnb carriage house right now right. because I might get some EVPs we on might. this fascinating ghost hunting looking recording device we're speaking into right now i feel like a ghost personally oh but you will be one day you will be someday maybe i'll haunt this place it's a nice place it's really cute yeah however i i was about to say that last time you came you stayed in my basement Mm -hmm. and it was a little disruptive because it was so haunted because the damn dolls just kept running around well i have since disposed of the dolls but Just in the last few weeks, I've had several things happen, which have made me believe that the house is indeed still haunted. Ah, crap. Now, I did tell our patrons about a recent incident I had where I fell asleep in the basement and some strange things I saw wandering around as I was like halfway in between waking and sleeping. And they were moving through the furniture and staring over my husband's shoulder, looking intently at what he was doing. I was awake enough to be able to see him and talk to him. So I wasn't like in sleep paralysis or asleep or anything. I was just really, really sleepy. But I was able to talk to him and I could see these things looking at him. And I did not tell him because I didn't want him to freak out. That's fair. Yeah. However, I've had some things that have been happening while I'm wide awake in the area where we record. And Diana, I think this is because of what we're doing with our lives. <laughs> what are we doing with our lives? Tell me more. What do you mean? Well, I have been recording ghost stories out of this basement nook for a while now. You have? I have, yes. I wonder, I, did you know that? <laughs> this is news to me. <laughs> And I have had a couple things happen that I want to tell you about. They're little things, but it's kind of like your haunted basement, Diana. Just mm-hmm. little things that sort of add up. It does. It takes a lifetime to realize sometimes that a place is haunted when you don't have multiple, multiple people working the late night shift or trying to integrate themselves into the place. So it's not a hotel or a business. It's just a house. It takes a long time to figure out that it's haunted. I have this experience myself, so I get it. I've been having a lot of experiences where I see somebody coming in the door next to me Ah, when nobody's there. The door to your specific recording studio? Yes. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. I keep seeing the door open and somebody walk in. Okay. To the point, I don't know if you've seen me constantly looking to my left sometimes when we record. I do, and I assume it's the living that you're looking at. No, no. Yeah, and I have my hair pulled back a lot of times because the headphones are pulled back, so it's not like I'm seeing my hair in my peripheral. Right, right. And what does Ella think about all this since she's your constant recording companion? Well, honestly, this always happens when she's not in the room. Uh, Yeah, yeah. Ella's my cat. If you're new to the show, she's 
oftentimes, not today because we're not anywhere near Ella right now, but <laughs> you might hear loudly in the mic sometimes. Our <laughs> singing her sweet song of ghost stories. She is a sweet cat. And yeah. she is our constant cameo companion. You'll probably hear her later in this episode. She also cannot be without me. She's like an extra appendage. <laughs> so she has to be all the time on the podcast, all up in my business. But you hear the ghosts when she's not in the room. Do you think there's a possibility that she is attempting to defend your territory from outside the door? Maybe. I don't know. I don't know if she's smart enough for that. <laughs> because Amber's dog is constantly, whenever I use the bathroom, if I leave the door ajar, she'll bust in, sit right in front of me and stare into the hallway angrily. Well, dogs are protectors. Cats just don't care. That's true. They're like, if you want to go get yourself haunted, you go yeah, ahead, humans. Yeah, whatever you want. I mean, they're just so much like, I don't care, whatever you want to do. Well, that's true. Yeah. Well, anyway, strangely enough, this does not happen when she's in the room. Yeah. Now, okay. a couple other things that have happened. The other day when we were recording, you noted that you saw something move in the camera beside me. I sure did. That was weird. I didn't remember that, but I just, yeah. It was a portrait. I have this really, really bizarre piece of artwork. I don't think it matters what it was. But I do have a really bizarre piece of Soviet realism. She oh. looks like Rosie the Riveter, but she's shushing instead of strengthening. Yeah, it's <laughs> it. Yeah, it's Soviet propaganda realism. <laughs> it is an art movement that happened in Soviet Russia, and she is saying in Cyrillic, "Don't gossip. Even the walls have ears." I love it because it's so morbid and such a reminder of. How horrible our history really is. It's only as a planet. So I keep it around because I'm a sicko like that. <laughs> anyway, that picture was just kind of leaned up against the wall behind me because it has nowhere else to go right now. And you saw it move. I did see movement down there. I thought it was just the camera or something, but... No, the camera is stationary. The camera is attached to the top of a very large monitor. Oh, that's right. You don't use your laptop. No, it's not like I can bump the laptop and have oh, the camera move. Interesting, because yeah, it definitely moved while we were recording. A few days before that happened, I was sitting in the chair recording or working or something like that. And I felt the back of the chair depress, like a cat jumped in it with me. Which happens. It does happen. So I was like, oh, the cat's here. Yeah. Cat wasn't there. Uh-oh. Door was shut. Nobody there. Oh. Something jumped in the chair with me. Was it warm or cold or neither? It felt like that it jumped onto the top of the seat behind me. Okay. Like a cat would, but it wasn't a cat. So like if somebody walked up behind you and leaned on the chair. Yes. On the top of the chair. If somebody leaned on the top of the chair... But you can't lean on top of the chair because the top of the chair was up against a wall, which makes it even weirder that, that it weird. pushed down. Yeah. And the chair has actually done it one other time. But I tried to duplicate it when it happened. Of course, I was like, did yeah. it shift a certain way? Right. Did it get stuck to the wall and then your weight put it down after a few minutes or something? Yeah. No. No. Nothing like that. Oh. Chair just moved. Okay. What do you think it means? Well, I think it is my basement's haunted. Oh, we yes, knew that. Yes, yes I, I knew that. But I've also had a few things move around on their own. Papers and things have crinkled and shifted. There's absolutely no ventilation in this room. It's kind of a, a sick place to work. I probably shouldn't be in there. There's no ventilation, so there's no reason anything would move around on its own. Right. But I've heard that hasn't gotten in the wall lately. Right, right. Yeah. So it's what this always happens when I'm in there all by myself. Nobody's in there with me. So I've felt things, I've heard things, I've seen things. And the dolls are gone. So we can't blame the haunted dolls. So he did loves. What do you think is going on with my basement? If you would like more of us in your ear holes, you can become a member of our Patreon. You can just go to patreon.com slash homespunhaints, sign up and get extra bonus content. A lot, a lot of extra bonus content. <laughs> Let's put it that way. And a Halloween present. Really? Have you been working on that? I will. Okay. <laughs> and a Halloween present. Okay, Diana's going to get out. So our highest tier patrons get special presents. And everybody gets special presents, though. So it's worth it to join. And if you're not a member of our Patreon, you'll probably enjoy listening to commercials like this one.
Today on the show, we are pleased to bring on author Ron Rickey. He sent us a story about something that happened to him long ago, and he has since turned it into a story and a poem, and I'm not going to tell you anything about it because once you hear what the title of this piece is, you're going to be drawn in, but (laughs) I thoroughly enjoyed reading this. He is an author. It was such a well-written story that I immediately wrote to Ron and I said, is this nonfiction? Because it reads like something you would pick up in a horror anthology, (laughs) and He said, yes, (laughs) this happened. So, Ron, thank you so much for coming on today. I appreciate you joining us. Thank you. As a matter of fact, I just thought about this. I think what I'll do is I'm not going to read the title and I'll just go into the story because the title kind of gives things away. It would be like if Sixth Sense was titled Bruce Willis is Really a Ghost. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, kind of the movie. you got a point okay no that's yeah. perfect although i just ruined yeah. that movie for anybody who hasn't seen it like, it's like, too late oh, sorry there's no santa either oh there god i can't <laughs> what am i doing <laughs> yeah if you haven't seen the sixth sense by now what are you even doing with your life right <laughs> Well, Ron, tell us a little bit about you. You said that you've written 14 books and edited five anthologies and you have more books on the way. Tell us all of the stuff that you're up to. I just constantly am doing books. I have next year's coming out with McFarlane is The Many Lives of the Purge. It's about the franchise, which interestingly enough, and a lot of people don't realize this, but The Purge was Stalin's mass genocide. And so I started writing for my opening about the dangers of Russia. And this was before the Ukraine crisis. And so now it's coming out after. And so everybody's going to be like, well, of course he's making that connection. But I did it before. I was sort of warning about Ukraine way before because Russia just has this history of doing the invasions along those lines. So when I was writing about the purge, I was talking about the politics of it. And I work a lot with Kevin Wetmore. He's brilliant. So I did the many lives of scary clowns with him. And he got the Bram Stoker nomination for his piece that was in it. So it was my first time ever getting to go to the Bram Stoker Awards last year. It's freaking, it's just like, you just look everywhere and it's all the icons of horror. It's, it's amazing. If anybody's listening from Bram Stoker, please start a podcast nomination. That is like essential. <laughs> That sounds great. Yeah. You also have a lot of stories and poems that have been published. Is there anything that you'd like to highlight? I just got a contract for, I have a book called We Look at the Body coming out with egregious pulp books that I just found out yesterday I got a contract for. It's two security guards find a dead body and then they're just, one of the guards like psychologically messes him up and then the other guard is like, it's a serial killer. I know there's more bodies. So then he starts like doing his own detective work. He's just some security guard. <laughs> he's like acting like he's this big detective. And so it's about them trying to deal with this this body that they discovered. It was Fine. really fun to write it. Ooh. I think I published like 14 books so you can peek around for other stuff. And I've written for the Tales of Terror and Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and No Sleep podcasts. So a bunch of those too. So those are really, really Great. awesome podcasts. I'm sure your fans would probably know about them too. But you, oh, can, you can Google my name in those podcasts and you can check out the things I wrote for them. Tell everybody how to spell your last name so they can actually Google it. Oh, that's a good point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so it's just R-I-E-K-K-I, which is, I think, probably the world's record for the most misspelled six-letter name in the history of the world. So um, you can just throw out a bunch of random letters like that, and it'll hopefully eventually get to me if you misspell it. <laughs> no worries. And we'll have all of that on our show notes for this episode at homespunhaints.com. So if you missed any of that, all of those links to Ron's books and to his publishing pages and things like that will also be on our show notes. So you can find those. And Ron, speaking of stories, you have one that you're going to share with us today. Okay, let's jump right into it. Sure. I discovered the book in the Lakeview Elementary School Library. You weren't supposed to be in the library during recess, but the students were a little too violent for me. I didn't like the yelling and the name calling and the occasional fist fights that seemed to break out when I least expected them, mostly not involving me, but I didn't want to be around anyone fighting or yelling or name calling. I liked the library where it was quiet, and I also liked that I wasn't supposed to be there. The library was in two parts. There's a main room, which often would have clubs like the philatelists who would meet and talk about stamps for an entire hour, which I didn't think was possible, but it was. And then there was a back room, which was separated by a heavy black curtain. No one usually looked back there because it was so dark. I could have kept hidden every recess 
and have never gotten caught, but I like to read. So I'd risk being discovered by inching close to where the light broke through the breaks in the curtain, reading with the help of its little slivers of brightness, moving the book across the sentence in order to read. There was a buzz to doing this with people a few feet on the other side, not realizing I was there. I found the books to be intriguingly inappropriate for my age. I think they were high school books that got donated in the library and simply didn't have time to read them because they were books that seemed simply pornographic and others that had the strangest tales of zombies and superstitions and witches. Except the odd part was the way that the books were presenting it not as stories, but as reality, that the witches actually existed. I'd always considered them fantasy, but the books explained paganism and how there were clubs of witches, organizations like the people on the other side of the curtain. I wondered if they were a collection of witches themselves, if the stamps were a front for what they were really doing. Then I got discovered. I remember the horror of it, one of them seeing a slight movement from something, me, behind the curtain, pulling it back and revealing this kid sitting alone with a book in his lap. What was I doing there? They called the teacher like it was some sort of felony, and I was told I was banned from the library, <laughs> surprised at how angry they were that I wanted to read. I remember the explanation of consequences if I was found again. They told me I needed to learn not to be so afraid of people. I needed to learn to be social and I needed to learn how to step out into the violence of play. I tried, but I hated having my ankles kicked during soccer, not being able to walk without pain for the rest of the day. And there's simply a pull to go back to the library, my banishment making it even more intriguing and tempting. And one thing in particular that stuck in my mind was a magic spell. I still remember it all these years later. I don't like even thinking of it, the rhythmic and cantatory rhymes, the awful content. Why was that book there for children to read? It haunted me. I couldn't remember the steps that went along with the recital of the spell, so I had to sneak back in to write it down. I waited until the library was open after school when it was okay to be there. I grabbed the book and I wrote down the steps. Then I had to convince my cousin and Ed. Surprisingly, they agreed to do it. We had to wait until midnight. We decided that Ed would be the one sacrificed. My cousin was a Lutheran and so he thought perhaps something might actually happen. And if it did, he didn't want it to be the one standing in the circle because what was supposed to happen according to the book was the ground would lower and that person standing in it would descend to hell. The ground giving way like an elevator. Incredibly terrifying. But we had to find out if it would work. <laughs> I wanted to know if the world was truly that insane, that horrible. The first night, Ed backed out. A night later, he backed out again. Until finally one night, a raging full moon night, hardly a night he could refuse with its soft wind and the distant nearness of Halloween, he agreed. We found a spot by my old fort, a really simple fort, a few boards carelessly nailed to a tree. Our neighbor, an old thin Air Force retiree, not liking that, wanting us to respect those trees. He would really not like what we were doing now. We drew the circle, made the insignias on the ground with a stick, set up Ed precisely as instructed in the circle center, and said the words in unison, which was not easy to do, simply because it gave you a chill to utter what we were required to chant. I'm not kidding, writing this now, even at my age, even with my lack of belief in ghosts, I still look behind me in the dark of this room at 3.58 a.m. to make sure nothing was behind me. But Ed was positioned in the moonlight. Ed, a thick future high school football star of Nagani, his simple, kind demeanor. If there was ever somebody who should not have been sacrificed to the devil, it was Ed. We said the words and waited. The dark hole of night. The sounds that came from the woods so eerie, subtle, hints at things alive. You can say you're the type to not be afraid of things, but if you put yourself in specific environments like a witchcraft circle on a breezy full moon night, there are undeniable emotions that curdle up, horrors that run under and over the skin, and none of us liked what we were feeling. But Ed remained immobile. With a flashlight, I looked at the instructions, wondering if I had copied something down wrong. I said we should start over, retrace the drawings, maybe say the chant louder, but they didn't want to. And that was probably good. If we did do it correctly, if the ground did open up, what then? Would we be immediately damned ourselves? Were we already anyway? I talked to my cousin about this months later, and he said he didn't want to talk about it. That He went to church and confessed that it was something he didn't want me to bring up. 
And I wonder sometimes years later, if every failure I've ever had stems from that night linked to it, a constant karma. And Ed, what happened to him, fabled football success in high school, then getting a girl pregnant, someone who he'd later wish he'd never met, then getting another girl pregnant and another, so many children, a complication of kids, a full family, so that visiting his house later always had a circus feel, what in many ways I've always wished for. Me, still single, I have dated two perfect Christian girls and those relationships collapsed, women who haunt me with their perfection. I don't know if you've ever dated someone who felt was perfect for you, who gave you real happiness, only to have that relationship fade in a way that frightens you, in a way that leaves you trembling from the loss. I'm talking about the terrors of loneliness that only magnify the older you get, and you wonder why it keeps happening, where it all started. But maybe it was worth it, that tingling, when we were waiting for the earth to collapse. So much potential in the horrors of our youth. <laughs> in the name of this story, is we tried to sacrifice Ed to the death. <laughs> <laughs> that is an apt name. I love that story. And then the history of it was published in the Way North Collected Upper Peninsula New Works Anthology with the Wayne State University Press that won the Michigan Notable Book Award. And then it was also published later as a poem in the New Orleans Review. And then I also read it on The Moth, but I didn't read it. Actually, I just talked about it on The Moth. The funny thing was it just killed with laughter. I didn't realize how many people would find it funny. <laughs> <laughs> I guess there's comedy there, maybe stupidity. Well, just the very <laughs> fact that I think Ed would agree to this. Like, okay, you can sacrifice right, me the devil. Right, Ed. <laughs> I, okay, okay, so I have so many questions. <laughs> right? First of all, why that spell? You said that there was almost like a pagan bookstore or something had just dumped all of their materials at the <laughs> library. So you could have conjured something for money or, I don't know, tried to make someone fall in love with you or something. But no, you decided on a spell to sacrifice your friend to the devil. <laughs> so, so what was the thought process there? Why that one? <laughs> well, first of all, I have to say, this is elementary school. So if anybody's not three years <laughs> Right, right. I get that. <laughs> and I think in the story, like I kind of say, there's no way. Is this real? And I was like, we have to try that. Because I was like, if this is real, we have the craziest world ever. And then I was, oh, okay. All right. This is imaginary. Thank goodness. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think maybe it's the exceptional boredom of my hometown. <laughs> and then just like almost like scientific experiment. I'm sure some people will listen to this and just hate me and be like, how could you do that? But... I don't know. I was just a kid. And so I was like experimenting. But then at the end, you could see there's guilt from both my cousin and me that was serious where he goes to confession for it and where I start wondering if I've screwed up my entire life by doing something like this. And then Ed is just kind of oblivious. He just doesn't care. Like like my cousin, he actually say, don't use my name when you tell that. Oh, you know wow. What I mean? Even so, <laughs> so I have purposely avoid his name. But whereas Ed's like, he just doesn't care. <laughs> Does your cousin take this seriously still? Well, he's like, he's, you know, I can be a big Christian too. So it's like sometimes you start thinking like that. Like, I, I, I pray every night and, you know, I try to be a good person, but I don't know. It's, and then it's kind of funny. It's like, what, what's the stupidest thing you've ever done in your life? And now talk about it in various venues. <laughs> That's what being I, a writer it, is. Exactly. I relate so much to hiding in the library, doing illicit reading of witchcraft. <laughs> <laughs> While I'm supposed to be doing something athletic, yeah. this is my life. So you and I, we would have gotten along great in two separate corners. <laughs> I'm just randomly grabbing a book and I'm like, what in the <laughs> hell is this? It's like talking about zombies and doing the same thing about how zombies are real. And I'm like, what? Of course I can't put that down. <laughs> this is crazy. So zombies are an actual thing. <laughs> Were these books just in a cardboard box in a corner or were they actually shelved? They were shelved, but they were kind of uh -huh. tucked away. And I think maybe it was a, we haven't gone through these books or something like that. So yeah. I did. And then I, I, I didn't let them know, by the way, this is incredibly appropriate. <laughs> you know what I just imagine is just like a whole bunch of kids doing that. And there's all these kids throughout the whole city just trying to sacrifice their friends <laughs> to the devil. You never know. <laughs> so what part of the world are we talking about here? What city were you in? I'm from the Upper okay. Peninsula. You mentioned that Ed had kind of a run of bad luck, perhaps of his own doing, impregnating um, many women that he 
probably should not have. Yeah. But also the, the follow up to that is me almost being jealous because I'm like, I've always I've had a friend like this. He never, ever wanted to have children. He's said said that over and over. And then he had kids and I've always wanted to have children and I never have. And I'm like, why does it work like that? Oh. Do, you, do you think that it could have had something to do with this? Like it's kind of a karmic reprieve, if you will. Ed is the one that got all the children. I know that's what kind of the end of it is. Uh, that's what I'm starting to play right. with is like, are things going bad because of, like I said, like karma? But then also then what you want to do is you want to do really good things. And I've tried to do that with my life right. as well. Well, I mean, if you sacrifice somebody to the devil, though, it's supposed to give you something in exchange. So would you say there's been any good things that have possibly come out of it? Maybe your soul is damned, but... Oh, God, don't say that. Oh, my Lord, <laughs> please. Sorry. Please, well, I'll definitely be praying. But the thing that's weird is it's with story is it has just morphed into the moth and the mm -hmm. way north and the New Orleans review and homespun haints. And it's a thing where I think... I'm a little bit embarrassed by what we're talking about right now, of course, right. and feel a little bit bad. But then also, like I said, it wasn't three years ago. It was when I was in elementary school. Yeah. But then also trying to process it. And then I had a teacher and he said, by the way, when you have something that's working, you don't have to do it. No, you're done with it. You can write it as another story. You can turn it into a poem. You can turn it into a moth thing. You can put it into different forms because if it's something that works, you can keep exploring that. And so that's something I've been playing with that is, okay, if I tell it again, how do I tell it again? And, and to be honest with you, the way that I told it, I mean, I read it to you, but the way I'm talking about it, I kind of have had discoveries even as I'm talking about it. I'm sure I'll get done with the podcast to you today and I'll be like... No, I never thought of it like that before. When Becky was saying, maybe your soul is damned for eternity. Sorry. I hadn't thought of that, Becky, you little brat. <laughs> you heard it here first. Homespun haints. We are muses. <laughs> so do you believe in ghosts? Well, I've seen enough of them that I probably should. <laughs> yeah, I kind of don't. And the reason why is I just don't see them. And I, I think maybe what, the way I'm going to word this to you is I'm really big. And so I just randomly get asked to work in haunted houses. Like somebody will be rocking down the street, see me and go hey i run a haunted house you're perfect and I'm like what does that mean like, what are you saying and i've actually had that happen with film directors well, I've, I've been in two movies uh, for one i was the title character oh, wow. i was at a film festival and the film director was like you know you would be perfect for film and and i think it's i'm huge like i'm really big and i think that's i, I will say this when i walk down a hall and i turn a corner routinely i scare the crap out of people <laughs> just like i turn around the corner and people have screamed or they just jump back and I'm like, sorry, it's just my body. I apologize for my presence. <laughs> Maybe it's my face. That, that um, is an odd thing to be recruited from the street for. You'd be perfect to terrify people. But but then I do it. And yeah. it's it's amazing. And I've gotten to act with like really incredible people like Joe Pantiano from The Sopranos, wow. who's just a stunning actor. The point I was trying to make is this. I used to work in haunted houses. And so one of the things I would do in the haunted houses is I loved to hide. And I liked to hide up high. And one of the things I love to do is I love to reach down. I have long arms. I'd reach down and very gently, I would just touch the hair. So not the skin, <laughs> but just their hair. And then they would look up and be like, and they'd be, somebody just touched my hair. And then they were like, no, they didn't. And they're, and they're like, I swear, something just touched me. And that would freak them out way worse than having somebody come out with all the makeup and costume because it played with their mind where then they started walking throughout the whole thing, kind of crouching down, looking up, going, I swear somebody touched me. And then they're like, dude, nobody touched you. Just relax. And I was like, oh no, I, somebody did. And it was me. <laughs> but the thing is, when I would do that, there would be a group of people and I, I realized I could just swoop my hand down once because they're doing it twice. It's too dangerous because they're going to, the second time they're, they're looking up. So I can only do it once. And what I had always do and this is so mean but also they're paying good money for this is i would always target the person who looked the most afraid oh <laughs> yeah so you're just looking for who's terrified right now they're looking everywhere they're looking to the left and the right they're not looking up and then i would reach over and now they're already scared as hell and now i do that with their hair and now they just scream and this is the thing i loved 
that person's screaming would scare the hell out of everybody in the group. <laughs> so then they became almost like a member of like, because they're just like screaming full tilt. Then the people in front of them would just like flinch and turn around and go, what? They scared the hell out of me. And so then what I wouldn't do is occasionally this would happen. You get, typically it was a group of guys and they're all walking together macho and none of them are afraid. And I just let them walk by I'm like, you guys are not here to, you're not here to have fun. So I just let them go by and nothing would happen. And I think sometimes that ghosts are like that. Like they look at me and go, that guy has no fear of us whatsoever. Why the hell am I going to appear for that guy? Leave him alone. Who cares? Whereas like for somebody who believes in ghosts, the ghosts are like, that's the one I'm appearing to tonight. Eight <laughs> times. I can't wait. <laughs> I like that theory. That's a good one. <laughs> it's not my job to convince you of ghosts. <laughs> Which by the way, I got to ask you this. Do you guys know the Paulding lights? It's been vaguely mentioned, but if you want to tell us a story about it, we'd appreciate that. So this is in Bruce Crossing. Michigan, which is Bruce Crossing to me, just reminds me of Robert Johnson, the yeah. crossroads, <laughs> just the name of it. But people see at night, they just see this light that is inexplicable. Scientists have actually gone up there to study it and they've wondered if it's like swamp gas. But for any listeners, the Upper Peninsula is known for the Paulding light, which is this inexplicable light that people just see randomly. And then Standard Rock. Some people say the most haunted lighthouse in the entire United States. It is officially the most remote lighthouse. It's like 24 miles off the coast from like Marquette, Michigan, mm -hmm. where I grew up. It's in the middle of nowhere. It's like this engineering feat of how the heck did they even build that thing there? And so it's so remote that people couldn't, when it was first put up, they couldn't handle it. They couldn't keep people there. But so for anybody who's interested in haunted regions of the U.S., if you're interested in Upper Peninsula, Michigan, it's Bruce Crossings, Paulding Light, and then the Standard Rock Lighthouse are the kind of the big okay. two. There's some lights too in the Appalachians too. We have the brown light to North Carolina and some other weird light mysteries going on there. I, I bet it's all related. I'm sure it's all related. It's not swamp gas. <laughs> so you mentioned growing up rural, Upper Peninsula. What sort of folklore, you know, we're all about folklore here. What sort of folklore did you grow up with there that maybe people from the rest of the country may not be aware of? You mentioned the Paulding Lights. You mentioned the Lighthouse. Are there any cryptids or just local ghost stories or weird lore that you grew up with? Well, I'm part Karelian. Very far north. It's going to be Arctic like area. When Russia and Finland had the war, it got cut in half. So some individuals, Karelians, are on the Russian side. Some are going to be on the Finnish side. But I have a story that's in Rappahannock Review, the Rappahannock Review. It's called Popoinik. And that is a really good Karelian. Of course, I'm taking it into fiction. But it's, it's that when after a spirit dies, that spirit can roam the earth for a certain amount of days, like, for example, 40 days. And mm -hmm. so this one father commits suicide. And, and as soon as it happens, the son knows his father's going to be coming and finding him. So then he has 40 days of he's just on the run to escape his father's ghost. Oh. And that one is a really good story. If people want to read it, it's uh, at Rappahannock Review. We'll make sure we include links to it. So tell us a little bit about the folklore behind that. So that's part of the belief that the spirit has 40 days after death. Yeah, there's another one as well that I, for some reason, when I got told this, I was really stunning to me, but it's kind of a maybe a bit Finnish, Karelian, Sami mix, although I'm not really sure which one of the three it is or if it's all of them. But it's that if you have a extreme blizzard, it's at night that if you go outside and if you stare into it, you're going to be able to see in the back of it, the dead from your city or your town will be all standing there looking at you. Mm -hmm. And I remember the first time that I heard that, I was like, wow, that's crazy that if you try to focus into the center of the blizzard, you're going to be able to see the dead from where that you live. And for some reason, that really stuck with me. Yeah, um, wow. I think sometimes what sticks with you is when you get told those sort of things, sometimes the person telling you is it's telling you in a nonfiction tone right. that mm -hmm. then they like underlines it. And then you're like, oh, my God, I've never done it. I was going to ask, actually... <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had one thing that I was going to tell you, too. I, was, I collected all the letters I had from when I was in the military. Mm -hmm. And I have this one letter. It's a June 6th letter that I sent to my parents. And it's about it, an interaction with a ghost. We were in Spain. We had run into someone 
who was a matador. Oh. We had talked to him, a nice guy. I didn't speak Spanish, but my friend did. So they were talking Spanish. Then I remember we had been speeding and there was back roads. And there was one point where we ended up going off the road and he slammed on the brakes and we stopped right at a cliff. <gasps> and we got out. Yeah, and we got out and we had looked over the edge and we're like, oh my God, we could have died. And then, I mean, I haven't read this in forever, so I'm kind of going from memory. Then what happened was we went to this bar and we were talking about how we met this matador, how cool he was. And then they said, oh, you met a matador? That's amazing. Like, matadors are really highly respected in Spain. They couldn't believe it. Like, that's an honor that he, he talked with you. And then he said, who was it? Because he loves bullfighting. And then my friend said the name and, and he was like, what? And then he said the name and he said, that, that guy was killed by a bull. And so, so my my friend was like no that's who it was and and the guy was like no you talked to a ghost that that guy is dead so it became this big thing where i just didn't believe it but my friend was convinced that the guy that we talked to was dead <laughs> <laughs> and then my friend was convinced that we got protected by this ghost of the matador and stuff it was i think the thing that sometimes with people who are like kind of debunkers is they're like you're just reading all that into it and you're putting all this false narrative on it but yeah that's the fun thing though as you're living life especially if you travel and you're just going all over the world just crazy interesting things like that happen one of the things i had to do in the military right off from boot camp i don't know why they had to do this but we had to do security patrol and they would make us go into the most remote locations that we didn't need to even go into. And we're not allowed to turn lights on. They said you could only use your flashlight. And so we'd have to go in all these empty barracks rooms. And then they would tell us stories about people who committed suicide in boot camp. And they're like, they're haunting in those rooms. And then I was like, oh, great. Thank you for telling me that. So then I'm going with my little helmet, my little flashlight. And, and there the drill instructor told us, you better go to every part of that room. And he goes, if I find out that you're not fully exploring the rooms, because he's like, we got to make sure that they're completely empty. And so I was like, oh, God. I know some people, what they do is, is they would, they kick open the door and they just throw the flashlight around and then they'd leave. They'd be like, that's good enough. And I was like, oh, I got to do this because I don't want to get in trouble because he can really punish you. So I remember going into these rooms that would be 80 bunks or whatever, you know, huge rooms that were just empty. And then the hard part, you had to go into the bathrooms, which were in the back. And it was just with a flashlight. And this one time, it's like, I don't know, three in the morning. And I'm going through the room. And you have to look underneath the bunks to make sure there's nobody down there. And then I'm going into the bathroom. And in the back is where the showers are. So then the rumor is that people hang themselves in the showers. So that's where the ghosts are supposed to be. And it's far in the back, completely quiet. I have my flashlight. And I turn the corner. And there's a face right in front of me. And I just shook. And I couldn't believe it. And it was my drill instructor was hiding there <gasps> waiting to see if I was going to actually go into the, into the header. Oh, what a bad. Yes. And I was so nervous. I said to him, as I said, am I supposed to report this? And he said, who are you going to report it to? Me? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was like, oh, I'm sorry, sorry. And he goes, he's like, continue on your way. Yeah. Well, Ron, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your stories about how you tried to sacrifice Ed to the devil, unsuccessfully, thankfully, and how you apparently encountered a ghost matador who <laughs> saved you from going off a cliff. I'm just going to apply that narrative for myself. I, I, I like that. And how your your drill sergeant pretended to be a ghost in a shower. <laughs> I don't think he's trying to be a ghost. He just looks like a ghost. <laughs> I think I've told you off there, but you guys have a phenomenal show. I love it. You guys have really good interactions with each other. And then I love how much you know. So it's like a really fun podcast to listen to. So thank, thank you. you for having me on it. Cool. We really appreciate your time. You've been listening to Ron Rickey. He is an author of many works of nonfiction and poetry and we will include links to all of his current books and then anything upcoming once it's published ron please let us know and we'll add it to the show notes as well in the thank future. you thank you very much thank you guys thank you for having me yeah thank you ron and thanks painted loves we hope you enjoyed this story what do you think which of your friends would you try to sacrifice to the devil surely that'll get you a spooky day Homespun Haints is hosted by Becky Kielimnik and Diana Doty and produced by Homespun Haints Media LLC. Editing and music by Becky Kielimnik. Show notes by Diana Doty. 
If you have a ghost story and you'd like to be considered as a guest for this podcast, please visit our website at homespunhaints.com slash submit.